Module 7 will discuss the payment design process for widenings in rigid payment design. Pavement widening falls into two different areas, strip widening and lane addition. Strip widening is where additional width is added to the existing pavement because the existing pavement width is less than the department's required design lane width criteria. Many times this is done for safety considerations the minimal practical width should be three feet to reduce shrinkage, cracking, and joint details are very important and will be covered later in this module. In this example, additional width of concrete pavement was constructed on the outside to provide the median width to accommodate left turn lane transitions to the next pavement section. Lane addition is where full lanes are added. This is mostly done to expand capacity. In this case, the extra payment was to add a new ramp lane from the new Salmon Expressway connector to I-4 westbound in Tampa, Florida. You can see the lane addition in the typical section and also a picture in the bottom of the widened lane. Intersection improvement is a hybrid of the two. For example, the road may be widened on both sides less than full lane width to accommodate a turn lane on an undivided section. Other improvements, addition of complete turn lanes where there is adequate median space. When evaluating if a pavement can be widened, at least two main questions need to be asked. Is the existing pavement condition adequate to provide extended life without extensive rehabilitation? And is the existing location programmed in the future for uh, widening, reconstruction, or realignment? For widening, the existing roadway pavement typical section needs to be researched. This could include information such as slab thickness, slab dimensions, embankment soils, and drainage. For older pavements, check thickness in the center of the road and the road edges. Some were built with a thickened edge. Request 18 kip easel data for lane addition widening. This is to assist the evaluation of the remaining life of the existing pavement and the thickness desirable for the design lane. For strip widening, the 18 kip easel calculations are not necessary. Before determining slab thickness, make sure to analyze the life remaining of the existing pavement by closely examining any deterioration of the pavement. Refer to Module 8 and also the Rigid Pavement Design Manual, Chapter 8, for distress types and severity. Pavement thickness determination. For a strip widening project, there is no formal analysis needed of the existing pavement. Just match the existing pavement thickness. The benefits of matching existing pavement thickness are water flow between the existing slabs and the subway subgrade will not be disrupted, pooled or dammed and trenching adjacent to the existing slab below the slab bottom may cause a weakening of subgrade support along the pavement edge and that may be avoided. Also, preservation of any existing edge drain systems may be possible. Pavement thickness determination for a lane addition project. A formal analysis needs to be done to determine proposed thickness. If the calculated thickness is less than the existing, the thickness of the new lane should match the existing thickness. If the calculated thickness is greater than the existing, the calculated thickness of the new lane should be used if adequate drainage can be assured. Actual payment performance may be different than the predicted by the AASHTO equation. Engineering judgments should be used to evaluate the remaining life and thickness required. These are pictures of lane widening for the Gateway Expressway I-275 southbound here in St. Petersburg, Florida. This is widening of a new receiving lane for a new ramp from 118th Avenue North to southbound I-275. 
This is an aerial view of the concrete lane widening for the same project. For the new southbound on-ramp from 118th Avenue North to southbound I-275 in St. Petersburg, Florida. As you can see, there is still MOT and construction being done. Here's a sample plan sheet showing the Gateway Expressway new southbound on-ramp from Roosevelt pavement widening to tie to the I-275 uh, pavement. Embankment and drainage details are critical to the performance of the payment system, as discussed in Module 4 and also addressed in the Rigid Payment Design Chapter 4. Embankment considerations, existing utility clearance relative to depth of excavation, especially in older urban areas. The loss of subgrade support along the pavement edge and settlement of adjacent pavements and structures due to excavation. Traffic control plans in cases where the width of the existing pavement is less than 12 feet will affect the selection of barricades. The recommended type of edge drain system for widening is Draincrete Edge Drain System, Standard Plans Index 446-001. As you can see in this picture, they're installing this filter fabric under the pipe before placing the Draincrete that will be shown on the next slide. Draincrete is used because the strength of the material provides lateral support of the existing pavement base and supports heavy loads on the pavement surface over the pipe during and after construction from heavy construction equipment, off-tracking trucks and other forces. Project information needs to be obtained on the existing drainage. This is important in the location of edge drain outfalls. If the outfall is tied into the existing stormwater drainage system in an urban area, any normal flows will need to be below the outlet end of the pipe. If no drains, drainage system is available, the outfall end of the pipe will need to be located where it not cause problems to pedestrian traffic and or maintenance. Included is an example of widening next to the existing pavement and the edge drain details to support the pavement design. Joint details are very important to the performance of the concrete pavement for pavement widening. Failure to follow these guidelines can result in slab cracking. Shown here is a sample joint detail sheet for ramp widening. Transfer joint spacing should normally match the existing pavement at 15 feet or less. This includes contraction and expansion joints. Closer joint spacing should be provided when the length of the existing slab is greater than 15 feet or there is a significant number of existing mid-slab transverse cracks. An additional dowel transfer joint should be added at the middle of the strip widening slab that are six feet or less wide and greater than 10 feet in length. For longitudinal joints, it is preferable not to tie a new concrete widening section greater than six feet wide to the existing pavement due to the potential stress buildup from differential shrinkage between new concrete and existing concrete. If tying the existing pavement is desired, then existing transfer joints must be matched in the widening and tie bars offset from the transfer joint by three feet joint details should be provided for areas composed of mixed geometry, such as ramps and intersections. Exceptions are widening such as lane additions where the same details for each slabs may be repetitive. Shoulder details when adding a lane. The shoulder should be appropriate for the type of facility. If concrete is used, it may be best not to tie the lane and the shoulder to the existing pavement in order to avoid unnecessary stress buildup. This concludes Module 7, Pavement Design Process for Widening. You're now ready to proceed to Module 8, Rigid Pavement Distresses.